supracondylar fracture of humerus supracondylar fracture of the humerus now you all know uh, the basic anatomy of the humerus bone the lower part of the humerus okay has got condyles and epicondyles as well so the area which is immediately above that is called supracondylar area that area is quite weak because it is the junction between diaphysis and epiphysis so we all know there is a junction between cortical bone and cancellous bone as a result of that that area can get fractured very easily okay so let's talk about it supracondylar fracture of the humerus is the commonest and most serious fracture in children you will see a lot of cases of this when we start working in orthopedic hospital a lot you trust me every single day there will be few cases of supracondylar fracture of the humerus in trauma center now this fracture occurs from the supracondylar region of the humerus that is the junction between the diaphysis and epiphyseal area so it is relatively weaker this fracture is very common in the young children okay just look at the peak age here seven and a half is the peak age and after the age of 11 year this fracture is rare so relatively younger children will come with this type of fracture regarding the types there are two type extension and flexion type extension type is more common now you may be wondering what is this extension and flexion type now let's go to our basic how we talk about displacement of the fracture should we consider the distal fragment or should we consider the proximal fragment yes distal fragment sir distal one sir exactly absolutely correct it's always the distal one proximal one is a reference you know we 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 put that as a reference and we always look at the distal fragment where it is moving is it going anterior or posterior so if it is going posterior we call that posterior or extension type of supracondylar fracture of the humerus and if it is going anterior we call that flexion type it is always the distal fragment so extension type or the posterior type is very common around 96 percent of the time this is the type of fracture flexion is just four percent so it is rare now please focus here see this now this is a very important slide and it is clearly telling you why this fracture is so important to to know okay see here this is the proximal fragment of the fracture here is the distal fragment every one of you can see this is the brachial artery okay brachial artery is right there at the fracture site and this is the median nerve so the sharp edge of the proximal fragment can damage brachial artery and the median nerve brachial artery is more important here okay now tell me if brachial artery is damaged at this area what will happen to the forearm yes what happens to the forearm Sir, ischemia will be developed. The late stage gangrene will be developed. What's the plan? Very good, very good. Excellent. The answers are coming. Excellent. Okay. So, in the beginning, we call that ischemia. If it is very severely damaged, then later on, those muscles may die. Okay. Those muscles may develop infarction. And later on, there is one very important complication which you have studied before that is called Volkmann's ischemic Volkman. contracture. Very nice. Volkmann's ischemic contracture develops and the forearm, all the flexor muscles of the forearm will be contracted. They will become shorter because they are replaced by fibrous tissue. So the fingers, they are acutely flexed, okay, because those flexor tendons become shorter now or they are pulled up. This is known as Volkmann's ischemic contracture. So this can be one of the important complication of supracondylar fracture of the humerus. Now, let's come to the median nerve. If median nerve is damaged, okay, you can give 
a lot of signs and symptoms now because median nerve is the main nerve for the flexor compartment of the forearm there is ulnar nerve also but ulnar nerve only supply you know medial two muscles all others are supplied by the median nerve there okay so similar situation may happen those muscles will be paralyzed they cannot function properly and extensor muscles on the other hand are working fine so there is a clear cut imbalance between them and one more thing the sensation which is supplied by the median nerve and the palmar aspect of the hand will also be gone now let's focus on this uh, x ray see here now what can you see this is ap view and this is the lateral view okay ap view and the lateral view looks a little bit similar here actually now see this uh this one you can clearly see there is a bit of fracture there is a bit of overlapping this area it doesn't look normal at all okay so these are the different things this is a lateral this is a clear cut lateral view there's no doubt about it uh what type of uh, fracture according to the classification is this which which fracture yes is this flexion type or extension type just have a look and tell me or in other word extension means posterior so is it posterior a displacement posterior. or anterior displacement extension. Posterior. extension on posterior one extension exactly you can you can clearly see isn't it you can clearly see this this is the posterior you know this area is the posterior so this distal fragment is going backward or posterior or extension so this is a extension type of supracondylar fracture of the humerus see this this is a humerus bone this is a elbow region these are the two bones of the forearm okay this is ulna this is radius so it's a very clear cut picture now uh, this is ap view this is ap view again so there is a clear cut displacement but we cannot uh, clearly see uh, from the ap view or where it is going okay still i can see a little bit you know uh, displacement there now let's talk about the causes of uh, supracondylar fracture of the humerus this is one of the commonest fracture in children we already know that so why uh, that area is uh, very common to fractured let's talk about it the lower end of the humerus is a weak part or weak bone due to its typical anatomical peculiarity and that is explained by a thin flat lower end okay and this uh, lower end of the humerus is actually uh, epiphysis you all know that and uh, when uh, diaphysis ends and epiphysis starts that is the junction of the cortical bone and cancellous bone that's why that area is very easy to fracture one important point in another one there are certain anatomical structure present like olecranon fossa is present posteriorly where olecranon a uh, process of the ulna lozes when the elbow is uh, extended and anteriorly there is a coronoid fossa where the coronoid process of ulna lozes so because of this fossa that uh, the part of the bone is not thick it is a thinner one so it can get fractured easily okay this is a important point now what are the uh, causes of fracture we already talked about this is very common in children so frequent fall on elbow is the cause of fracture now in which position if they fall then there is a high chance of fracture now the mechanism are fall in out stretched hand on a slightly flexed elbow this is a very very common procedure and the children usually they play when they play uh, or on the monkey bar or play with the friends and if their friend pushes them then you know uh, without the knowledge we, when we fall not only children anybody when we fall remember we just uh, you know out stretch our hand and then uh, we give support there isn't it so during that mechanism or process there is a fracture so this is one of the mechanism another is fall from a height and third is road traffic accident or motor vehicle accident so these are 
some of the important causes of a supracondylar fracture in a child. Now see here, this picture is telling us, okay, the, the two, two children are probably, you know, fighting with each other. One child has pushed the other and look there, this is a defensive mechanism. Even if we fall, we may fall like this. This is a defense mechanism. This is known as fall on outstretched hand with a slightly flexed elbow. And this is the way by which supracondylar fracture of the humerus occur very commonly. Now, look at this x-ray once again. Okay, take a bit of time. See that please. How you know the second x-ray okay, is abnormal and the first one is normal. So that is the you know point you need to look here. See this. There is no fracture line. Okay, there's a very smooth outline on the outer surface of the humerus there. Okay, so it looks like a normal, but here, see there, I can clearly see some irregularities here. Okay, it is not a smooth line. And this one slightly displaced here. So this is a fracture. So this is how we identify it. Not a big displacement, okay? Not a big displacement. If it is a massive type of displacement, we can see it very clearly. Now, what are the clinical features of this type of fracture? There will be pain and swelling in the elbow region. The pain is excessive because this is a fracture of the bone and swelling is also excessive. There is a deformity of the elbow. These are classical symptoms of the fracture. See that? S deformity of the elbow because of the displacement. And the common displacement is posterior one. Bony landmarks are abnormal. Dimple sign is present. Now, what is this dimple sign? So let me explain this. One of the spike of proximal fragment is penetrating the muscle and tethering the skin. So see this. The spike of proximal fragment is penetrating the muscle and tethering the skin. That would happen very commonly because the proximal fragment of the fracture goes anteriorly and the distal fragment goes posteriorly. So this spike of the proximal fragment may penetrate the muscle and may elevate a small you know, part of the skin there. Okay, So this uh, uh, near that area, we call that dimple sign. And the same mechanism is responsible for damage of brachial artery and median nerve as well. Arm will be shorter because of displacement, because of displacement arm will be shorter. Remember, the, the distal fragment will move slightly proximally and the backwards. The most important problem here is the neurovascular injury. Otherwise, this fracture is very easy, easy to treat. But if neurovascular injury occurs, then it will become complicated. So we have to assess the median nerve and the radial nerve function. And you have to assess the pulse that is radial pulse. If radial pulse is already weaker than the other side, we know brachial artery is already compromised. Okay, now we need to uh, be hurried, you know, for the treatment. A proper treatment is provided in time. We cannot wait any longer. Let's move on. Now, look at this picture, uh, all of you. Look at the typical, you know, deformity of the supracondylar fracture of the humerus. It almost looks like an S-shaped deformity. See, S-shaped deformity, okay, this one. Now, this definitely is a posterior or extension type of the fracture and the proximal fragment is coming anteriorly. You can clearly see in this schematic diagram. This is the anterior fragment. See here, this, is, this has a very sharp spike. This spike may damage the muscle and Tether a part of the skin here that is called dimple sign. This is the distal fragment which is moving posteriorly. Very typical of supracondylar fracture of the humerus. And this is responsible for 
neurovascular injury. Now, this is a real patient picture. So you can clearly see there. There's a deformity of the elbow. It's deformed. And there is a bit of bruise also we can see. There is a massive swelling there. This area is swollen. This is a typical picture of supracondylar fracture of the humerus. Even elbow injury or elbow dislocation may also look a bit similar. Now, this is an x-ray, okay, which is showing the supracondylar fracture once again. This is ulna bone, this is radius bone, so this is an elbow region. Now, here is a fracture, you can clearly see. This is the distal fragment of the fracture, this is the proximal fragment of the fracture. This is the shaft of the humerus. So, supracondylar fracture of the humerus, okay. Now, uh, in this, there is a dislocation of the elbow also. Okay, this is another very important uh, uh, traumatic condition which we are going to talk after we finish this fracture. I'll move on to the elbow dislocation. Now, pay attention here. The one of the very important practical, you know, examination we are going to talk. Sometimes, supracondylar fracture of the humerus is confused with elbow dislocation because both of us at the same site, there is a huge swelling of the elbow. There is a lot of pain. So how can we differentiate between them? One simple clinical examination we are going to do. Now see here, uh, this is okay, a triangle. Okay? This is an equilateral triangle which is formed there. Now this is the base of the triangle, okay, and this is the apex of the triangle, and these are the two sides. Isn't it? Now, this equilateral triangle is formed by the three bony points. Now, two bony points are two epicondyle of the humerus, medial epicondyle and the lateral epicondyle, and this is by the tip of the olecranon process. The olecranon process is a part of which bone? Yes? Allah. 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 Very good. Very good. Everyone know that? It's a part of ulna bone. See there? So it is forming a, a very nice triangle. Now, in case of displacement or dislocation of the elbow joint, okay, dislocation of the elbow joint, this triangle will be disturbed. This equilateral triangle is no more there. But in case of supracondylar fracture, okay, this is undisturbed. We can still palpate these three bony point and still the triangle is, is there. So this is the important point here. So let's come back to the slide. Elbow dislocation is sometimes confused with the supracondylar fracture of the humerus. The two may be distinguished clinically by palpating for the equilateral triangle formed by the olecranon and the epicondyles, the two epicondyles. This will be undisturbed in supracondylar fracture, but distorted in elbow dislocation. This may be asked, uh, you know, by some of the orthopedic teacher in your exam. Now, what's the uh, treatment of supracondylar fracture of the humerus? Just like any other fracture, we have two types of management. So one is called conservative management, another is called surgical management. In orthopedics, conservative management means okay, you are not going for surgery. Probably you are putting some plaster there, like a cast or a slab, okay, or some subtraction, those type of management. And operative uh, is a surgical one. Now pay attention here. First, we have to reduce the fracture if it is, you know, uh, displaced. If it is displaced, we have to reduce it. And the commonest type of displacement is the posterior one. Another thing, if there is evidence of arterial obstruction, we definitely have to reduce it. Otherwise, it continue to compress the artery. If there is unacceptable angulation because of a too much displacement, we have to reduce it. 
And in other word, if displacement is more than 50%, we have to reduce it. Okay. So reduction, everybody know, this is a very basic thing in uh, point in, uh, you know, trauma or in orthopedics. Reduction means whatever displacement is there, you know, you bring back, try to bring back to the normal. So the non-operative way of managing in case of non-displaced fracture is quite simple. You put a long arm plaster slab in 90 degree flexion for three weeks. So long arm plaster slab in 90 degree flexion for three weeks. Means the elbow is put under a flexion. Okay, 90 degree flexion. Then you put a long arm plaster slab right from the arm. Okay. It goes on the back of the elbow and it goes the whole of the forearm. This is called slab. Remember, difference. There is a difference between slab and the cast. Cast means it's a circumferential thing. Okay? But slab is just put posteriorly. Just a support there. And we have to put the sling as well. Regarding the operative treatment, there are certain indications. And those indications are displaced fracture, Vascular injury and open type of fracture. Very easy to understand. Now, what type of operation they do? They put okay, K wire, okay, or percutaneous pin. Percutaneous pinning or K wire. K, K means Kirschner wire. You already know that. Followed by limb cast, okay, with elbow flexed. Now, a little bit less than 90 degrees. After uh, you, you know, uh, put uh, this uh, pin for the surgery, then limb cast has to be put. Now, there's a difference between slab and the cast. I already talked about this. In adults, orif is necessary. Now, this is not, uh, you know, orif. Remember that you have not uh, opened that site. You have not give the incision to open the fracture site. So we cannot call it open reduction. With the help of X-ray, the surgeon has done the percutaneous spinning. So this is not ORIF, though it's a type of surgery. ORIF means you really need to open that fracture site and you need to see what is happening to the blood vessels and nerve. Then accordingly, you have to put some instrument there. This is ORIF, open reduction and internal fixation. Now, look at this picture. This is highly informative one. These are the collection of the x-rays there. So look at this, okay? Uh, Percutaneous spinning. So this is a clear cut fracture here, supracondyl fracture of the humerus. This is lateral view, this is AP view. You can clearly see the fractures here. This is the fracture line. So these are the pins which are kept, okay? Now, what are the complications of supracondyl fracture? Every student can answer this now because we have done this before. The stiffness of the elbow is the most common complication, definitely. That's why physiotherapy or active exercise plays a big role to decrease the chances of stiffness. Brachial artery injury is one of the major complications here. Brachial artery injury. Now, how brachial artery is injured? If somebody asks you the question, you always answer, the proximal fragment is quite sharp and the sharp end of that proximal fragment is giving pressure on the brachial artery. And brachial artery will get kinked, okay? It will get kinked and sometimes it will be damaged also. The wall of the arteries are damaged. Another one is median or ulnar nerve injury. Median nerve injury is quite common than ulnar nerve injury. Another one is a compartment syndrome, which leads to Volkmann's ischemic contracture in the long run. In the beginning, we call it compartment syndrome because of ischemia the muscles will get swollen, that edematous in the beginning, okay? But later on, they become, they die. And after that, they develop contracture. 
This is known as Volkman's ischemic contracture. Another important uh, complication is a cubitus varus deformity. Cubitus varus deformity. This is also known as gun stuck deformity. It's an important MCQ question in the exam. Cubitus varus or gun stuck deformity. Now, what is this? Distal fragment tilted into varus. Now, what is varus and what is valgus? Yes. Who can answer this? Varus and valgus. Valgus uh, are two word outside and varus inside, median side. Very good. Rana Atisham, excellent. Okay. He is absolutely correct. If the uh, distal part of the fracture after heal, healing, you know, after the fracture is united, if the distal part is going away from the midline, going away from the midline, we call it valgus deformity, valgus. And if it is uh, tilted towards the midline, if there is an angulation formed towards the midline, this is known as varus deformity. So varus and valgus deformity. So quite easy. These are quite important term in case of elbow. Myositis ossificans is another important complication we have discussed before. There is a big topic we discussed before. These are the general complication of the fracture. You know, we took a lot of classes uh, for that topic. So myositis ossificans. First, first of all, there is a hematoma. And that hematoma will be converted into bone, bony tissues. This is known as myositis ossificans. So there will be severe problem in the movement of elbow joint. Now we have come towards the end of this uh, important fracture. Now at the end, please uh, pay attention at this picture. Now, just now, I was talking about valgus and varus deformity to you. So, it, it, uh, it is telling uh, the meaning here. This is normal, okay, normal elbow. Uh, this is cubitus valgus deformity. See that the elbow is moving away, okay, the moving away from the side of the body. Or you can clearly say moving away from the midline, okay. It is fine. And midline, uh, this, is, this is the midline. This is the reference. See this. Midline of the arm is the reference. So it is moving away from there. And cubitus varus, okay, this is the midline, it is moving you know, towards the body. So varus deformity. This cubitus uh, term is used for elbow joint. So with this, okay, uh, let me uh, start another important topic, and that is elbow. See there. Okay. It is the elbow joint. Now, in the beginning, let's quickly see what are the bones that form elbow joint. It is the lower end of the humerus, upper end of the ulna, and radius. Okay, radius uh, also uh, you know plays a very small role in the elbow joint, but majority of the joint is formed by uh, lower end of the humerus and upper end of the ulna. It is also known as ulno humeral joint. See there, this is the another picture which is uh, uh, telling the same thing lower end of the humerus, okay, upper end of the ulna. So, this is the joint. Now, please pay attention on this slide now. Here is the radius bone, this is the ulna, this is the humerus. So every student should know about the landmarks here, okay? The landmarks are important. See this, this is the medial epicondyle. That's the lateral epicondyle, we cannot see properly because it is on the other side. Here is a trochlea, okay? Here is a trochlea. Trochlea is a lower part of the humerus bone. Trochlea. And is still on the other side of the trochlea, it's called capitulum. Now, capitulum is immediately above the radial head. The head of the radius, okay, it articulates with the capitulum of the humerus. Trochlea articulates with the olecranon process here, this one. 
polycranial nodes, I should say, is this area. Okay, so these are some of the important landmark. Every student know that already. Just revising it here. So again, showing the same thing. This is not ossified. That's why it is looking like this: medial epicondyle, capitulum. Okay, lateral epicondyle it cannot be seen properly here. Polycranial process, head of the radius. So this. Uh, a lot of the epiphyses they have not ossified here. Now, a little bit about the different ligament which are present in the elbow joint. Nobody is going to ask you in detail regarding this, but it will give you an idea uh, that is uh, how this elbow joint is stable. What is the reason for the stability of the elbow? See there. These are the collateral ligament, which are always on the side. Collateral ligament, they are medial collateral ligament and lateral collateral ligament. Medial is also known as ulnar collateral ligament. Lateral is radial collateral ligament. Okay, because ulna is the medial bone, radius is the lateral bone. Annular ligament, it's a circular type of ligament. Annular, it is, it is you know, encircling the elbow joint from everywhere. This is the one. So these are some of the important ligament and don't forget the capsule of the joint. Now, what type of movements are possible in elbow joint? See there? These are the different movements which are possible in elbow joint. Now before that, we need to know about the carrying angle. The carrying angle. Oh, see here. This is the carrying angle, and this carrying angle is 10 to 15 degree in female, and in male it is just 5 degree. Now, what do you mean by that carrying angle? Now, when we walk, okay, uh, you you have to stand on the anatomical position first. And I'm sure every student knows it, anatomical position. You have to, you know, face your palm anteriorly. And the palm, okay, the both of the hands uh, should be, you know, just touching the side of the body. And you have to look straight forward. Okay, anatomical position. But during that time, okay, during that time, the forearm, okay, the forearm will not easily touch the side of our body. Or another better explanation is when you walk, okay, in this anatomical position, you, you started to walk, the side of the forearm should not, you know, touch the side of our body. See this? That's what I'm talking here. This is the side of the forearm. There is the side of the body. They should not touch. Otherwise, uh, there is a problem in walking. This is known as carrying angle. This is called carrying angle. So because of the carrying angle of the elbow, the side of our forearm doesn't touch the side of the trunk. So in female, it is a slightly, uh, you know, bigger carrying angle than in the male. Now, the different types of movement in the elbow joints are flexion around 145 degrees. And extension means, you know, this is the normal position of the elbow. We call it, you know, the extension is the reference point. So we call it zero degree actually. Clear? So we, we compare everything from the extension. You ask the patient to flex the elbow from the extension position. And when the person can do that, he can flex around 145 to 150 degree. So this is the flexion. Extension is the reference point. So we call it zero. Pronation and supination. Now, what is pronation and what is supination? I'm sure every student know that. Look at this picture here. Supination and pronation. So, in, in uh, supination, okay, when you stand in the anatomical position, okay, this is the supination position. You are showing the palm forward or anteriorly. Supination. And if you, you know, just rotate your uh, forearm, and if the palms are facing backward, this is called pronation. This is called pronation. So supination and pronation are possible up to 90 degrees.
frankly speaking this pronation and supinations are not the real uh, movements of the elbow joint they are the movement which occur in radio ulnar joint now radio ulnar joint uh, look here uh, there is a uh, you know a joint formation in the upper part of the radius and ulna and the lower part of the radius and ulna this is known as upper okay radio ulnar joint and this is lower radio ulnar joint or proximal and distal radio ulnar joint whatever you want to say so these are the responsible joint for pronation and supination movement but it is very very close to the elbow isn't it so we roughly say this occurs in the elbow Now with this, okay, let's uh, talk about dislocation of the elbow, and this is the one important pathology we are going to talk here. This accounts for around 11 to 28 percent of the injuries to the elbow, and regarding the anterior and posterior dislocation, posterior is more common than the anterior, and this occurs very commonly in the young people, and usually associated with sports injury. Well, let me tell you one important point. Uh, one question from the dislocations of the joint will be definitely asked in the exam. And uh, more important type of questions than elbow would be shoulder and hip dislocation. But that doesn't mean, you know, you don't need to study this. This is also important. Many patients come to the hospital with this type of dislocation. So we should have some knowledge regarding this. Now, what's the mechanism of injury here? Most commonly, it is again, Fall on outstretched hand, also known as F O O S H, a fuss type of injury, or you directly landed on the elbow. Hyperextension injury or valgus stress injury, okay, is another important mechanism of injury. And anterior dislocation can uh, result from direct force. Let's move on. Most commonly, elbow dislocates posteriorly. By now, every student know that. And remember, whenever there is dislocation of the joint, the first thing you need to do is immediate relocation. You need to immediately relocate the joint. Otherwise, there is a high chance of neurovascular structure damage or cartilaginous complication uh, that is present, isn't it, in the joint. So because of this, dislocation is considered as an orthopedic emergency. It, you cannot ignore it. You cannot say, oh, wait, wait for one day. Then I'll, I'll do probably next morning or evening. It's nothing like that. Once the patient of dislocation comes, you need to immediately attend and do your job. Now, what are the clinical features of elbow dislocation or how you do clinical evaluation? Patients typically present with injured extremity and they are guarding that extremity what does that mean they are okay catching that elbow and the forearm with another hand because there's a severe pain uh, they cannot hang that elbow during that elbow dislocation so what they do they will guard that elbow dislocated part uh, with other hand Patient usually has gross deformity and swelling, but natural. Difficulty in gripping the fist, of course. Okay, there's dislocation, so the distal part of the limbs uh, doesn't function properly. So there is difficulty to grip the fist. A careful neurovascular examination is quite important. You have to examine for brachial artery, especially by palpating the radial pulse. You have to examine for median nerve, okay, as well as radial nerve. That neurovascular examination should be done before the treatment and after the treatment as well. To confirm the dislocation, we have to go for X-ray, okay. X-ray, that is radiographic evaluation. We need to take anterior posterior view and the lateral view of the elbow. Remember, you have to take before you reduce the dislocation, that is called pre-reduction X-ray, and after you reduce it, post-reduction X-ray has also been done. 
because uh, if you are if it is uh, nicely going inside okay and then we can see it if you are not satisfied we can do the maneuver again there is one important point which we discuss uh, during the topic of dislocation sometimes there is a complicated type of dislocation complicated means there is associated fracture around the joint so we have to look for those associated fracture as well and if they are present we need to treat for that now please focus on this uh, you know picture now, see this this is a very informative picture see this is a clear cut case of elbow dislocation this is a posterior dislocation of the elbow that uh, area is not hugely swollen like in fracture it is not swollen okay and uh, the person is guarding that okay dislocated arm with the other hand that also you can clearly see and then one important point i told you before there is an isolateral triangle which is formed by three bony points the two bony points are of two epicondyle which are the part of the humerus and one is by the olecranon process of the ulna these are distorted in case of elbow dislocation it's quite important point and this is another uh, picture which is showing the elbow dislocation here uh, the swelling is more than the first one now in posterior elbow dislocation the radius and ulna are forcefully driven posteriorly to the humerus that is what elbow dislocation is all about and when we talk posterior they are going posteriorly because they are the distal bone and we always name the dislocation and the fracture uh, according to the movement of the distal fragment specifically in posterior elbow dislocation the olecranon process of the ulna moves into the olecranon fossa of the numerus and the trochlea of the numerus is displaced over the coronoid process of the ulna this is what happens okay after the dislocation posterior elbow dislocation a ped okay is the short form for posterior elbow dislocation but uh, this type of uh, you know use of short form is discouraged in the exam okay please don't write like this in the exam in this class because we are talking about this topic so it is easy for us but don't use it generally it is classified as simple or complex simple means no associated fracture there complex there is some associated fracture around the joint now this is a you know beautiful x ray not so beautiful for the patient but good for us to see the clear cut case of elbow dislocation now please uh, look look at there carefully can you see any fractured bone there any fractured bone or not no sir no sir only dislocation exactly. no sir this just dislocation so so what what we call that complex dislocation or simple dislocation simple simple dislocation no fracture exactly this is a simple dislocation okay the classification is quite easy simple type dislocation or posterior dislocation of the elbow now few more x rays which will you know help you to understand even better you see this it's a clear cut case of dislocation so this okay this is, this is a lateral view this is ap view this is also lateral view see this the lower end of the humerus is completely out of this olecranon cavity okay or notch there is another one so these all are uh, very good x rays which are showing elbow dislocation another one very clear cut one no no connection at all so elbow dislocation posterior elbow dislocation now there is one important term which can be asked in a mcq exam of orthopedics that is known as terrible triad okay terrible triad what is the meaning of this Let's see here terrible triad is a term used to describe a severe complex dislocation so complex dislocation means there is some fracture now 
So what are you fractured? Intraarticular fracture of the radial head and coronoid process of the ulna. Along with dislocation, if there is fracture of the radial head and fracture of the coronoid process of ulna, we call it terrible triad. And this is a severe complex type of dislocation because along with dislocation, there is some fracture along with it as well. Triad means three things. So what are these three things here? One is elbow dislocation, one is fracture of the radial head, and another is fracture of the coronoid process of ulna. Now, once again, you may be a bit confused. Where is this coronoid process? Remember, only cranial process is posteriorly and coronoid process is anteriorly on the ulna bone. These two processes are present on the upper part of the ulna. Now, elbow dislocations are staged depending on the disruption of the following stabilizer. And this stabilizer are the ulno humeral articulation. MCL and LCL. Now, these are quite commonly used term in orthopedics. Whenever we talk about joint, we use this type of term. This is medial collateral ligament and lateral collateral ligament. Even when we talk about the knee joint, you know, these are the terms which are used there. So medial collateral ligament, also known as ulnar collateral ligament. Lateral is a radial collateral ligament. And ulnohumeral articulation there is a capsule of the elbow joint. These are called stabilizer of the elbow joint. They make the joint stable. Now what may happen? During the forceful dislocation, these are the uh, uh, ligaments of the capsule which can be damaged or disrupted. That's why you need to relocate the joint quickly. Okay? The more delay we do, the more damage will occur in this, uh, you know, ligaments and the joint capsule. Now let's move on. Now, I'm going to talk about the same triangle, okay, which we discuss in supracondylar fracture of the humerus, because. This is an important, you know, clinical question asked by a teacher. So let's revise once again. The triangle sign is obtained by palpating the tip of the olecranon, medial and lateral epicondyles of the humerus, while in elbow is in flexion, resulting in triangle configuration. This is always uh, in flexion only. In extension, you know, all these three points will come in a straight line. When we extend our elbow, uh, these three points will come in a straight line. So there is no triangle formation. Triangle is formed only when you flex the elbow. So this is a clear cut picture here. Let me use the pointer. See this? Okay. These, these are the things here. Now, uh, in case of elbow dislocation, this triangle is distorted. This triangle is distorted. So where is the triangle here? See this, this is, a, this is the uh, elbow dislocation. It is not an uh, equilateral triangle anymore. This is called distortion of the equilateral triangle in case of elbow dislocation. But in case of supracondyle fracture of the humerus, you can still you know, identify uh, the part of the triangle. What is the treatment of elbow fracture and dislocation? Now, treatment is reduction. Very easy. Reduce the uh, dislocation as soon as possible. That is the answer. So, in case of posterior dislocation, that we have to reduce under sedation. Definitely, this is a painful procedure. So, close reduction done under sedation you have to keep some powerful sedating agent like benzodiazepine along with some strong analgesic, opioid analgesic will do the job. So combination of diazepam and morphine would be wonderful here. The reduction should be performed with the elbow flexed while providing the distal traction. This is the way of reducing and after reduction is completed, 
put that joint under splint with elbow at 90 degrees. This is for the immobilization of the joint. If there is a complicated type of posterior dislocation or complex type of posterior dislocation, that means there is a, some fracture or something like that, that open reduction is highly suggestive. Okay. It is also done for severe soft tissue injury or bony entrapment as well. Now, what is the treatment for anterior dislocation? Similar. Close reduction under sedation, but remember the distal fragment is going anteriorly here. So when you reduce it, you need to use a bit of different type of procedure. That's it. Otherwise, the whole uh, management is similar in posterior and anterior dislocation. Now, this is a, you know, a few pictures which are uh, you know, showing how to reduce elbow dislocation. You don't need to know this uh, in detail because you are not the one who are going to do about this treatment. Okay, so what what I want you to know is just diagnose a case of elbow dislocation and know how to examine the patient so that the patient will not go undiagnosed and quickly refer to the orthopedic surgeon. That experienced person will do this. That much we need to know, and then slowly. When you start working there in the orthopedic hospital or center, you assist the orthopedic surgeon first, then you learn slowly. And when you are experienced, then you can do this on your own. That's the way. Now, what are the uh, complications of elbow dislocation? What can happen to the patient? A stiffness. This is a common complication of any joint dislocation. This is because of, you know, immobilization for a longer time. So active physiotherapy is necessary later on. Intra-articular loose body. This loose body is formed by fracture of a small piece of bone there. Neurovascular injury, like ulnar nerve damage, median nerve damage, and brachial artery damage, it may happen. And even the radial head can be fractured. Recurrent instability is uncommon in case of elbow joint. This elbow joint is a stable type of joint. Now, the reason uh, for stability of the elbow joint in comparison to the shoulder joint. Anybody can give me the reason here why elbow is more stable than the shoulder? Yes? Because the three bone joint and having circular capsules and other many type of ligaments. Okay, good. Good, Israel. Because, because it does not enjoy the full movement like a shoulder. Glasses it it has so many connections with the other points. Good. Not that Good. much rotation. Good. So see that. So many different answers I am receiving from the students. Excellent. Okay. All those answers are correct. One, it doesn't enjoy that much freedom like a shoulder joint. Only you know, four types of movements are possible around the elbow. Flexion, extension, pronation, and supination. That's it. And one thing, remember uh, that anatomy. The olecranon, okay, notes is quite deeper. And the trochlea is nicely fitting there. In comparison, the head of the humerus is quite big in comparison to the very shallow glenoid fossa. And other, there are quite a strong type of collateral ligament on the sides of the elbow, like medial collateral ligament, lateral collateral ligament, something known as annular ligament, and even the capsule of the joint. So these are uh, stronger support rather than shoulder. So, so why, what I am telling here is, you know, you have already done this before. But these type of questions are very commonly asked by the teacher. So don't get nervous, okay? You can always synthesize this type of answer right there. Show that confidence, confident face to the examiner. That's it, okay? Every concept is already there because we, are, we have already done that in the beginning. Now we are uh, just, you know, putting that into the practice. We are talking each and every reason of our body. So after this, uh, Upper limb is over. 
I'll move on to the lower limb fractures. Okay, and then we'll move on to the general orthopedics. Now, today, uh, in this elbow uh, class, there is one more thing I like to talk, which is epicondylitis. What do you mean by lateral epicondylitis? And what is medial epicondylitis? Now, see there, all of you, please focus on this slide. Very, very important uh, questions are there from the exam point of view. Now, lateral epicondylitis is also known as tennis elbow, and medial epicondylitis is known as golfer's elbow. Tennis elbow and golfer's elbow. Now, why this term has been given? Because these are the common injury which occurs if we move our you know forearm or our upper limb, okay, like this type of movement. For example, somebody is playing tennis when they you know or continuously play, there is a lot of stress felt by those forearm muscles, especially the extensor muscles. Okay, they they uh, feel a lot of stress when somebody is playing active long tennis. Similarly, golfer's elbow, the flexor group of muscles uh, are uh, stressed a lot during uh, you know a golf play, but that doesn't mean only these two types of sports develop this type of injury. Cricket is another you know, common uh, you know, sports where tennis elbow is very commonly occurring. So the meaning here is lateral epicondylitis is known as tennis elbow. And in this situation, there is inflammation of the common extensor tendon because they originate from the lateral epicondyle of the humerus. And medial epicondylitis is a golfer's elbow where inflammation of the common flexor tendon because they originate from the medial epicondyle. Never forget this. So how to, how to remember for a longer time? There's a small help for you. Tennis elbow, see this, lateral, this T, okay? Uh, we can remember this T as a tennis. So lateral epicondylitis is the tennis elbow and pain associated with extension of the wrist because uh, the extensor group of muscles at the back of our forearm are originating from the lateral epicondyle. That's why when we extend the wrist, uh, the, the person feels pain there. Now, what is the mechanism? What is the mechanism of this type of injuries? There may be repeated or sustained contraction of the forearm muscles or chronic overuse, like in sports. Repeated or sustained contraction of the forearm muscles, either the extensor muscles or the flexor muscles. It depends on which type of movement you are doing. Now, regarding the clinical features, point tenderness may be present over the numeral epicondyle are distal to it because those places are inflamed. That's why we use the term epicondylitis, lateral and medial. So we, we palpate, we press at those two points. If the patient feels a lot of pain, okay, exactly at that site or a little bit distal to that, uh, there, there uh, you have the suspicion. Okay, probably the person is having it. Pain upon Resisted wrist extension in case of lateral epicondylitis or resisted wrist flexion in case of medial epicondylitis. Now, resisted extension and flexion is very easy to perform. You give a bit of force, okay, or you give a bit of power on the wrist area okay, and ask the patient to extend it. During that time, you are pressing the wrist downwards you are trying to flex the wrist, but ask the patient to extend it against your power. This is known as resisted wrist extension. During that time, if the person feels a lot of pain in the lateral epicondyle area, this is uh, you know, uh, very, very suggestive of lateral epicondylitis or tennis elbow. Similarly, okay, uh, 
resisted rest flexion. While we do that, if there is a pain in the medial epicondyle, this is gone for sure. This is generally a self-limited condition, but it may take around six to 18 months to resolve. But who will wait for that long, isn't it? That's the, that's the whole thing here. It may cause pain. It may cause weakness of the muscles there. The person cannot play the same, you know, with the same enthusiasm like before. The shot making, especially in cricket, the shot making may not be that powerful now because of the pain, because of the fatigability of the muscles. So early treatment has to be done. Now, what are the treatment? See this. Regarding the treatment of this epicondylitis, rest, give rest to those muscles. Use ice and go for the use of NSAID. These are a very easy general type of management. Rest, ice and NSAID. This ice therapy is done for Decreasing the inflammation. We all know ice will decrease the inflammation. Use brace or strap, okay, at those uh, muscle, uh, and then you know go for the use of them. Means give support to those muscles. That's the point. Physiotherapy, stretching and strengthening of the muscles are very important here. This is also a job of physiotherapy. Corticosteroid injections are one of the options because there is inflammation going on. So corticosteroid may decrease that inflammation. Okay, that is the whole idea. And surgery is the last hope. And surgery may be necessary in chronic type of condition. And that can be done by percutaneous or open release of common tendon from the epicondyle. That uh, is done only if our conservative therapy fails. And in a very serious type of situation it can be done. Now, where we give this type of injection in, in uh, epicondylitis? Inject at the center of the triangle formed by lateral epicondyle, radial head, and the olecranon. Okay, uh, so that that uh, corticosteroid will work in those inflamed areas. So this is about the epicondylitis. Very short topic, but quite important from the exam point of view, especially in the MCQ question. Okay.